I would like, one of, well, one of the reasons I was feeling so much love is yesterday I got to dance with you. I got to cry with you. I cried during Dr. Pico's poem. I also cried when he described what a true warrior is. And I got to hug a lot of you. Um, I would like Dr. Pico to start us off this morning by um, opening with prayer. And this very special to us that Dr. Pico has come here. I mean, after all, God appeared to him in a, in a hospital room. I don't mess with that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, but I also know that we have people of all different faiths and some people like me who've gone right in and out again from religion because, you know, actually religion can be traumatic too. Um, so Dr. Pico's going to open with prayer, but if anyone else feels really moved to um, offer some words, I want to open that to you as well. This is your conference. I just get to uh, watch it all unfold. Good morning. I'm honored to be asked to do the prayer. Um, talked about greeting people, and I'll just tell you something about the Kumeyaay Indians, who I am citizen of. Um, when we greet each other, we say hauka. And so through the years, that has been interpreted as, hi, how are you? Even with our own people. But when you look, when we interpret that of what it really means in Kumeyaay is, I see the fire that burns within you. That's what it really means. So hopefully we can do that with each other. I think that brings the humanity into into focus when we, uh, when we greet each other as brothers and sisters, true brothers and sisters. Um, when she asked, Ms. Garbold asked me to say the prayer, I start thinking about this. Because, remember in, in my remarks yesterday, when I began, I said, you know, I have met so many people of such compassion, hard work, empathy. That's all of you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You could just a lot of other places to be this morning and one of them might be in sleeping, uh, but you are here. And I know from my own traumatic past and my own adventure into um, first being aware of ACEs and then how that can be applied to myself and other people. So I know you've gone through that same thought process and you've chosen to help relieve the suffering of others. That makes us family. I don't have to even know you or even see you. I've seen you before. I know that you are in the trenches along with me that I love you already. It is, but it's it's in, it is unconditional because, um, you know, uh, I'm not, even though I, I grew up in the Catholic Church and I was an altar boy for many years and taught catechism, um, I'm not a practicing Catholic. Um, but when Jesus said to love your brother, of course, as yourself, now it's brother and sister. I think he knew that it's almost impossible to love everyone as if they were your spouse or your children uh, or your parents. I think what he did mean was we love each other enough to help them when they need us. Not at the expense of ourselves, I don't think, but the energy we have left over, and that's what you're doing. You're fulfilling that. So I'm going to lead you in prayer this morning, the way uh, we pray. And you do this. When you pray, I know you do this. Maybe you don't think about it so much. 
but you bring in, sac uh, bring in sacred space. Kind of like a, it's, it's almost a pre-awareness of what you're actually doing. I know when I was a kid, I was an altar boy. I was doing Hail Mary and, and Our Father, and we do the rosary and stuff. I wasn't even thinking about that. You know, I was just reciting these prayers. Um, but now I'm able to really think about what, what am I doing there? Why am I doing this? What's my purpose? And who is my purpose for? So that's part of bringing in sacred space. And I would suggest you ask your relatives. In our belief, we believe that you have to ask before you can receive. And the spiritual world that I believe we're all a part of doesn't, it's nothing like a, the physical world at all. So you can call your relatives um, to come in and sit with you, soothe you, help you recover. And so we call in our relatives. I'm calling in my grandparents. I'm calling in those people that I've never seen. And I went to a healing once from this Native American man, old man. He said he saw a lot of old Indians behind me. Um, and so I believe that they're there. And for me, it's not a matter of faith. I believe it. I believe it with my whole soul. So asking people to ask your relatives to come in. Um, those people that are gone now. And always ask, I would suggest, we always ask for um, gratitude in our life. Gratitude. Open your eyes in the morning. Think of all the goodness. Think of all the opportunities that you have. Think of the love that you now have an opportunity to have a random act of kindness with someone just once a day be opening the door for someone or picking up something that somebody dropped or something. Pretty soon all that stuff starts adding up and after about 300 days, you're rolling. Um, and so I could take this time now um, to call in the spirits of our ancestors, to call in our creator, to be grateful for all of us together as a family. We are family that we're on the same course, and we're doing the work of the Creator by helping to relieve the suffering of other people. I think that's the primary reason it is for me to be glad and for the suffering that we've had to go through in order to get here today. I have gratitude for that. I have gratitude for what the Creator has given us, the air, the water, the animals for us to enjoy. I have gratitude that we live here in a country where we're at peace. I know what it's like to be at war. It's not for humans. I have gratitude for all these opportunities. I have gratitude for being able to contribute uh, to humanity. Oh. So. Finally, we're going to get round to our first speaker, I promise. And Carol Kelson is doing amazing work um, in neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is one of the most exciting frontiers in trauma recovery. I believe in five years, ten years, every doctor's office, every school, every therapist, will either have a neurofeedback machine or be recommending people to go and do neurofeedback. Um, sadly, because, well, reasons we're probably aware of, the pharmaceutical companies, for example, really wouldn't be too happy if we found something that in the course of six weeks could uh, help resolve trauma in a way that the drugs can't. Actually, when... Um, we applied to the APA 
for uh, continuing education, ability to give continuing education, and they wouldn't give it to us because we're going to talk about neurofeedback, which makes me really sad because, you know, seven years ago, EMDR that you learned about yesterday wasn't a, an evidence-based practice. It took a while for yoga to become an evidence-based practice. And I think you deserve to know about this. I think every trauma survivor deserves to know about this. The trouble is it's really expensive. I looked into it for my son, and it's like $150 per session, and they told me two sessions per week for six weeks, and I don't have that kind of money. What I love about Carol is that she and her practice have been providing this free of charge to the Bell Shelter. I don't know if some of you are familiar. It's actually the largest homeless shelter west of the Mississippi. And it's right here in Bell in Los Angeles. And uh, so I really wanted to highlight the work that Carol and her practice are doing. So let invite Carol up to the stage, please. So this is Ben, you're gonna be seeing him in the videos and he actually works as a clinician at Bell Shelter. So he'll be answering some questions and you'll be able to uh, see uh, some of the work he's doing with the clientele there. Um, he's setting up two neurofeedback machines that um, I use in my practice. Um, there are different types of neurofeedback. Um, my PhD is in clinical psychology. So the type of neurofeedback I use is very client-centered. So as opposed to me being the expert and uh, looking at a chart and putting on uh, the electrodes based on a chart, I use a method where the client tells me how they're feeling and I adjust, or another type of neurofeedback that just um, is very safe and adjusts with the client. I'm gonna explain that all to you. Uh, and I wanna just kind of um, modify my talk according to the audience. So I'm curious if anyone could raise their hands if they're familiar with neurofeedback so I know uh, how, where to go. Okay, so I see some here. Okay, so some people have had uh, information about neurofeedback. So. Um, Interestingly, someone wisely and aptly told me that my uh, PowerPoint might be a little bit, you know, um, uh, academic and a little bit dry, so I'm going to speak more from my heart today. I'm going to use it as a background, but really I'm going to just speak from my heart and kind of just um, talk in a way that's more conversational with you today. Um, I want to, before I talk about neurofeedback, uh, say that neurofeedback is a wonderful tool. It's a great technology, I love technology and how it can help us, but it will never replace what all of you are doing. And I just wanna say that more important than tool or a technology is the love, the compassion, the kindness that all of you bring. And to me, that is the true healing work that has to occur. So this to me is secondary to all that's been talked about beforehand and Louise's um, uh, introduction and the prayer is really to know that the primary focus is really gonna be the love, compassion, and the kindness that you all bring to your clients. And that in itself does the most healing work. But that being said, I'm gonna to talk to you about neurofeedback as well. So I'm gonna explain neurofeedback in the sense uh, of an overview. So biofeedback, you may have heard of biofeedback, is anything that helps you learn how to do something on your own. So breathing can be a form of biofeedback where you learn how to breathe slowly so that you can regulate your heart and help yourself calm down. Kegel exercises, I, some women may be familiar with this or men also, but it's trying to strengthen a muscle so that you can have that strength on your own. Neurofeedback is biofeedback for the brain. So it's actually not a treatment, but a training. So it falls under the umbrella of biofeedback, but neurofeedback is biofeedback for the brain. So it's training your brain. And in this case, if you see my opening slide, it says somatic regulation. So neurofeedback is training the brain to help the body, somatic, the body related to the soma, to get more regulated. Because a lot of times in trauma, 
and anxiety and stress, our body gets dysregulated. Our heart rate might beat very fast. Our temperature may go hot or cold. You know, our adrenaline may rush through our body. And the somatic regulation, what the neurofeedback does, is help from a body level to get to a place of calm and to teach the brain how to get to that place of calm so that as life happens, you're better able to handle it. Some of you, I don't know if during this weekend, um, if window of tolerance was spoken about, but window of tolerance is a big term in, in the trauma world. So window of tolerance is that ability to be not in fight or flight and not in frozen. So the hyper arousal is the fight or flight. I'm gonna either run or I'm gonna fight and get angry. And the frozen is just kind of helpless and limp. The window of tolerance is in between those two states. Now, some people's window of tolerance is very shallow, especially if you've had a lot of trauma. You can flip into the fight or flight or the frozen more easily if you've had a lot of trauma. And what the neurofeedback is trying to do as it helps you get more regulated and it's training you is it's increasing that window of tolerance to be wider and wider so that when things occur, when life occurs, when a situation occurs, when uh, a personal engagement occurs that's distressing, that you'll have more space to handle it, that there's more ability to not flip into fight or flight or not go into that frozen, can't even talk, can't even respond, uh, type of mode. So it's actually teaching the brain to help increase that and so that we don't get into that fight or flight or that frozen state uh, as readily. I got interested in neurofeedback for several reasons. Um, as a parent, my uh, kids um, are now grown, but when I was uh, researching different work for my PhD, I wanted to find something that could help regulate parents. Um, because if a parent's more regulated, it helps you with your parenting skills. And I was finding that personally, my son on Sundays would say, Mom, I'm so stressed out, and it'd be 10.30 at night. I haven't done my homework. I have school tomorrow. I haven't done it. And I would, I would lose it. I'd be like, it's Sunday, 10.30. I mean, you had all weekend. You told me you were doing your homework. What ha Why are you bringing this up to me now? And it was a real concern, but I flipped my lid. The fight in me came out, and we would have these huge fights. It, it was a real concern, but the, my reaction was way too big. And like a simple argument and helping them get along the way would have been much better, but we'd end up fighting for an hour, and it would just be worse for him. So I knew I needed to regulate myself and that I had a problem. And I also found, and you know, this is just me personally, not, not saying for other people, that it would be worse once a month. <laughs> During a certain type of month, my fights would be more intense. And I said, you know, I'm looking for ways to regulate other people. I need to regulate myself. So I uh, learned different methods, and I'm very thankful. And I love EMDR, and I love the sensory motor work or the Peter Levine work. It's all great for trauma. And I, I think we're all here because we have experienced trauma, whether in ourselves or in our family. And so that's where some of the pa compassion comes from. So I love all that trauma work. But one of the things that I found in my trauma work is that I wasn't able to help some of my clients with either these things of hand, knowing that they shouldn't say something and they said it anyway, just like I was doing, or I had certain clients that had certain trauma, they couldn't talk about it. If they talked about it, it was re-traumatizing. Or other clients where they had a cord wrapped around their neck when they were born, or they had you know, um, hospital injuries and they couldn't talk about it. Or abuse that happened early on that they couldn't remember and they couldn't talk about it. So when I went to a course on neurofeedback, it was mind-blowing because no one had to talk about it. You could have this tool that helped you regulate without even talking about your problem. And I'm still very much a talk therapist, but I thought, huh, for those people who can't talk about it, there's an alternative. So I started using the neurofeedback on myself, and I found that the results were pretty great. And so then I started introducing it to my clients with, with wonderful results. 
And um, as I was getting my PhD, I was really thankful to the Bell Shelter because, um, like Louise was saying, it's quite expensive. The machines are expensive, and doing sessions are quite expensive. And um, EEG Institute, I'm very thankful to. They helped donate the equipment. And Bell Shelter, I'm very grateful to because they opened up their space for us to work with um, some of the homeless um, there to get neurofeedback. So what we did was we started with seven people who got five neurofeedback sessions a week and seven people who did not. They were the control group. And every week we had the, you know, the standardized PTSD questionnaire that is used. <clears throat> and each group would fill out the PTSD questionnaire. And the beautiful thing is, after 20 sessions of the people who did get the sessions, each one of them improved dramatically. The ones in the control group either stayed the same or in some cases got worse. We did tell those people in the control group that we wanted to make sure that we spent time with them as well, so we opened it up for them to get sessions afterwards. And so that's where Ben really stepped in, and uh, we both volunteered our time throughout this whole process. And I think for over nine or 10 months, we gave our services for free. And we just treated those who wanted to get help, and we opened it up to others. The ones who were in the group that had the neurofeedback, one of the first things that it really improved was sleep, and then it helped them get along with others. They were uh, cooperating and doing well in uh, their groups with other people. Another thing that it helped with was anxiety and stress. It can be very stressful living in a homeless shelter with over 300 people and having to deal with all those interactions. They sleep in these huge, large rooms. If you ever get a chance to visit Bell Shelter, it is amazing. The, they feed, a thou, they do a 1,000 meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They have hundreds of beds. But that's stressful to have to live with that many people. And one of the things that they found was certain people would yell at night just out of their PTSD or their stress. And some of those people that were having sessions started to quiet down and calm down. We had people who um, couldn't watch a, a TV show. They were too distracted, and it was you know, too hard for them to focus. And by the end of their sessions, they could actually laugh and watch a, a show on TV. So those are just some of the simple things. We are going to show some videos. I'm just going to do, um, I guess, a trigger warning. I mean, some people will talk about their experiences. We're going to try not to get too much in detail, so I hope it's not triggering. But I just want to let you know that we will be sharing, and Ben will be sharing about some of the clients. And you'll be seeing some of the clients on a video that's what I'm going to show, show shortly. So as a result, we were very fortunate that the Salvation Army decided that they would <clears throat> utilize money to support the neurofeedback clinic at Bell Shelter. So I'm very grateful to Ben because he volunteered so much of his time, and he is still there now giving sessions to clients every day at Bell Shelter during the week. And so we need more of this out there, and if there's a way to get more access, uh, we would love to do that. Um, I personally you know, care about all of you. And so I brought um, someone from my office with me. His name is Rob Barger. He's going to be staying after the talk and taking any names and numbers. Um, it is quite expensive, but for the people that are here, and if you're interested, we're going to do um, very low fee neurofeedback if you want to try it and see what it's like. So that if you do want to talk to him, please give him your email and phone number. We'll do a $20 consultation, so you could just kind of talk about what's going on. If you actually want to do neurofeedback that day, it'll only be $45 for both the consultation and a session, and so you can talk to him. There's nowhere where you're going to find that, and we can barely do that ourselves, but we want you to know about it because you guys are the change makers. You're the ones who can bring this out to the world, so we're doing it as a service because we want more people to know about it. Unfortunately, not a lot of people still know about the neurofeedback, and we want it to get out there. So I'm going to do a little less talking right now. I'm going to show you a video, and then um, I'm going to quickly go to, through my PowerPoint, but um, I'm going to try to stay here instead of here, and then afterwards we'll have another video and a question and answer. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychiatric disorder brought on by exposure to some kind of severe trauma. It's when the body and mind are unable to cope with a trauma, they tend to get stuck in a fight or flight mode. We see a lot of depression, severe anxiety, 
panic attacks, nightmares. We relate PTSD a lot to veterans and the battlefield, which of course the genesis is on the battlefield. However, there are lots of ways to get PTSD. I was abused pretty badly when I was young. I had a single mom with six kids. She was very, very violent when it came to uh, discipline. So I was always in the hospital, broken bones, broken hips, broken arms. She locked me in the basement once for a whole summer. For a whole summer, I was 11 years old. I couldn't talk for a long time because I stuttered really bad and I wet the bed. And so that was her way of punishing me. She was cruel. She was really cruel. I didn't like what my dad did. I didn't like how he raised me. I didn't like how he beat me. He was a drug addict, an alcoholic. I mean, all of it. That really affected me. I remember having a client who was woken up in the middle of the night to be molested by her uncle. For her, sleep's not a safe place. I recently had a, a gentleman who, at the age of five, woke up to his house on fire, and his brother was screaming because he was on fire. So his reoccurring dream is waking up to the scream of his brother being on fire. Just imagine getting two to three to four hours of sleep every night and then trying to function. It would be almost impossible to hold down a job. It's natural to do anything you can do at that point to be able to sleep and not feel anxious. I've had a drug addiction for 25 years. Methamphetamine, alcohol, marijuana, psychedelics, you name it. You know, I was diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia. I mean, a lot of this stuff. And I have no idea which ones were self-induced psychosis because of my addictions. I have no idea. I had a really big drug problem. What the stuff does to the brain itself, it loses the ability to feel happy. And, and you're thinking all these crazy thoughts. And then uh, that's when, like, the really big anxiety issues happen. That guy knows a lot. You can't get it out of your head, you know. Everyone knows. The only way I'd be able to sleep I've been up for too long. is if I pass out due to exhaustion. It'd be like three in the morning and I'm just like, finally four in the morning, I pass out, wake up at 10 and go, yay, I slept. And then try to function throughout the rest of the day, every day of the week, I just keep doing that, you know? When I first came to the Salvation Army, I was getting about two hours sleep a night. The Salvation Army Bell Shelter is a very large, homeless shelter our approach is let's help you get healthy physically spiritually psychologically the primary goal is to help obtain permanent housing at the time when i got in there i think i had six months sober but i realized soon after that that was just sobriety that wasn't recovery and there's a huge difference sobriety is just being sober every day recovery equips you with the tools that bell shelter was giving me anger management coping skills, parenting classes. Once I realized I was in control of my feelings, I was now in control of my recovery. And then came neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is an opportunity for the brain to see its activity in a moment by moment basis. We're just recording the energy that the neurons are making as they fire. We put this through a digital amplifier and then in through our program. All we want them to do is look at the screen. As the brain is able to see itself, the screen will get bigger, smaller, fade over. The sound will go up or down. The brain recognizes that the dance it's seeing, it's doing, and it's able to regulate itself from there. The client doesn't need to do much during the treatment except sit and relax. Let your brain do the work. Your brain gets a chance to see what it's doing and it will make the right corrections to heal in the right way. I could see the difference immediately. It gives you a sense that you have some kind of control over the way you think and the way you feel and, and the things that you focus on, you know, because ultimately that's what's causing the problem is focusing on the wrong things, staying in the past, uh, walking around in fear, you know, and that neural feedback gives you a chance to see it to see yourself taking control of yourself. It's uh, something else to wake up and uh, have energy that just sort of stems naturally. My relationships with my family is getting better and better. 
it's fun to be able to look at my nieces and nephews in the eyes and be like, yeah, you're doing great, you know? Life's just better all around, it's, it's simple. The nice thing about neurofeedback is as it diminishes PTSD symptomology, the client also feels less need or desire to self-medicate because they're feeling so much better. So it works simultaneously on what we call the dual diagnosis population, folks with PTSD and say alcoholism. It gives a lot of us in the field hope. When you're fighting this monster of addiction, anything that works is incredibly valuable. Neurofeedback's a gift. This recovery center is a gift. These individuals who come in here and teach us these things from their heart, it's a gift. This past February, the state of Arizona calls me up, says we have your son. I've been looking for him for like three years now. They're about to put him up for adoption. And I had no doubt in my mind that it was God because if that had happened a year before, there's no way I would have been able to step up to the plate and take him in, but now I can. If that's not God working in my life, then I don't know what is. You can't help but smile and just feel, you know, an incredible sense of joy because you know that this is a game changer for this person for the rest of their life. The reason is so important for me is because I do, I see I see it get passed down from generation to generation. I see a dad who was beaten or molested when he was younger do it to his own children. If we can help one dad not pass it down to a child, to me, it would make it worth it if we could do that. here in a little bit, but I'm going to actually show you the machines, and I'm also going to talk about um, the military also. Um, I have a keen interest in veterans, and when I did my PhD study, I actually used all veterans because of the high suicide rates, and one of the things that the veterans um, told me was that, you know, in the military, you're taught to be so strong. Weakness is not something you're supposed to reveal. And also, when you're in the military, you're uh, exposed to constant sounds and noises throughout the night. You're supposed to be prepared to wake up and go at, at any moment. You're exposed to all these chemicals. They're exposed to so much. So when they get reintegrated in society, and here they're supposed to be this strong person who can't sleep, and sleep affects our emotions so much, as you know, is that they felt helpless, and it's hard to ask for help. And so one of the things that I really um, uh, wanted to do was to see how this would affect the PTSD symptoms of those veterans who um, had been in war. And the results were amazing. So you can also talk to me about that later if that interests you. Um, I am going to tell you a little about the machines, and then I'm going to pull Ben up here so that he can answer some of your questions, and we'll do a question and answer session. But I want to actually show you the machines, and so you get an idea of, uh, of uh, the type of neurofeedback that I happen to use. There's more than these machines, but these are the ones that I use. I don't get paid by the companies at all. It's just that I, um, I love them because they're clinically based. They're very client-centered. Will this mic work if I talk in it? Okay, so um, this is the type of machine that we use at Bell Shelter. Um, it's a lot harder to learn, but it's amazing in terms of regulation. That uh, study showed that these people could sleep, some of them, and Ben will talk to you more about details, so I, I think I'll actually hold on to that. But this machine, the clinician has to learn how to get to the sweet spot. We're not putting anything into the brain. Both of these are non-invasive. When we put electrodes on the head, it's read only, meaning that it's reading the brainwave activity. It's not putting anything in. It's just reading it and allowing the machine to act as like a digital mirror, allowing the brain to know what it's doing. So if you're trying to learn a dance move and you want to look in the mirror and see what it looks like, if you can see what you're doing 
right or wrong, you can correct it because you can see the movement like, oh, that's not quite right. I'm not a dancer, so I'm not even going to try. But if you do the correct move, you'll be like, ah, oh, that's it. I need to repeat that. That's what neurofeedback is doing. It's giving a digital mirror to the brain so that it can correct itself. So this machine is so amazing for regulation. It also does trauma, but you have to regulate the brain first before you go into what's out called alpha theta work, which is trauma work. I'm gonna do a quick teaching of neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is working with brain waves. So you guys have heard about delta for sleep, alpha, theta, beta for thinking, gamma for peak performance. We're working electrically with the brain. The brain is electrical and chemical. So chemically, we can work with medications or drugs or nutrition. But electrically, we're working with neurofeedback. So one of the things, even though you could be on uh, medication with neurofeedback, if someone's using drugs and during neurofeedback, it's not going to be great. Because electrically, we're stabilizing the brain. And chemically, you can mess that up. So one of the nice things about neurofe um, Bell Shelter is that they have a sobriety uh, situation. You have to be sober to be living there. And that helps the neurofeedback be more constant so that we don't have someone who's using drugs or something that's going to throw off the work that we're trying to do. So I just want to add that as a caveat. You know, So it will affect the brain to put those chemicals in. This neurofeedback works auditorily, visually, and tactilely. So this is not my teddy bear or teddy cat. It's actually part of the neurofeedback, and it vibrates according to what the brain is doing. When the brain is getting a lot of reward, it's going to vibrate. When the brain is getting inhibit, it's not going to vibrate. And that's telling the brain what it's doing moment to moment. There's also a video often at Bell Shelter, they'll use a movie so the person can just be watching a movie and the screen will go out and in and that tells the brain what it's doing. The volume will go up and down and that's gonna tell the brain what it's doing. And it's all pretty much uh, in the background so the client can just be enjoying the movie and not realizing he's getting a session or she is getting a session at the same time. So that's this neurofeedback machine. Now, if you are a therapist or a social worker or someone who w talks to clients, you can also talk to a client while you're doing neurofeedback. And I do so in my private practice. You just don't want to get them too dysregulated because then the neurofeedback is going to compete with that emotion. And basically, it's helping the brain to get more calm, that calm and alert state. And if someone is talking about some terrible trauma, the neurofeedback is going to be fighting with that internal emotion inside. So when I do talk therapy, I try to keep it to be more conversational uh, if you do want to do the neurofeedback while you're talking. So that is an alternative. This machine is um, another type of neurofeedback that is inhibit-based training only, meaning when the brain is going in the wrong direction, it corrects itself. It has little clicks in the music. It's playing music, and every time the brain is going the wrong direction, it goes chick, chick, chick. So it's kind of akin to driving on the freeway. And you know how there's the little bumpers on the road? It's like, oh, you're kind of going that lane, chick, 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 chick. self-correct. Oh, you're going in that lane, chick, 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 chick. self-correct. Well, that's what this neurofeedback does. You'll be listening to music, and when it's clicking, there's nothing wrong with the machine. It's saying brain self-correct, and so that's how this one works. The interesting about this system is that uh, it works with all the brainwave activities, and if you go into an alpha-theta state, which can happen in the first session, you can potentially release trauma from day one. So alpha theta state is a state where it's like a deep meditation. You're not quite asleep, and you're not fully awake. I don't know if you've ever had a deep, deep meditation where you're, you're not here, but you're here. You're not, you're not out. And, you know, it's a very deep level. And if your brain goes into that state while you're on this machine, you can actually release trauma. Uh, just this past week, I had a woman who had, on her first session she said that she had a recurring dream, a recurring nightmare since she was little. And during her session, she could see that nightmare and she could remember it, almost like she was observing it, but it didn't have the emotional charge to it. She released some of that trauma from that dream in that first session. So you've heard of mindfulness. Mindfulness is about the ability to observe something. Rather than being in it, you can observe it. And from that observation place, you're able to release because it doesn't have that emotional charge. 
So potentially on this machine, you can actually do some of the alpha theta work right away. On this machine, you want to have at least 10 to 20 sessions before you start doing alpha theta work. This is really going to help uh, with precision, getting the body regulated. And then the, it will also help trauma, because when you're dealing with body regulation, it does help trauma, and also early trauma. Uh, but if you want to do alpha theta work, this one's going to have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, primarily, we suggest you have 20 sessions in order to affect long-term change. It may not fix everything, but at least by 20 sessions, we know that this machine is going to affect some change. This machine, um, you know, for those people who can't come regularly, I will use this machine because I never know what's going to be released. And I'm not in control of either of these, or we're not in control. Um, the client is in control. So it's both very client-based in terms of its healing. I'm going to uh, bring Ben up, and he's going to help answer questions for me. So we'll leave some time for question and answers. Just so you can see, uh, these are the neuroamps. So this is the neuroamps that digitize the information that comes from the brain, puts it into the computer, and the computer outputs either auditorily, visually, or tactically to the client what their brain is doing. We can look at it. Ben and I can look at it while our clients are having their session. We're not affected at all because our brain checks out, but their brain is completely tuned into the session. All right, so I'll introduce Ben Miller, and he has um, been the pivotal force. He is the main person at Bell Shelter. Uh, he's the only person. He's in charge of the neurofeedback clinic. I just uh, uh, discussed with him some of the clients, but he is the main person that you want to contact if you want to hear more about the work at Bell Shelter. So if you have any questions for either of us, we're going to leave it open to questions now. I'd just like to say before we do questions is um, the way I found neurofeedback, and I think a lot of people who do neurofeedback find it the same way, I was actually getting ready to apply to physical therapy school. So I had finished doing anatomy, physiology, physics, chemistry, all of that. And at the same time, I was working uh, part-time for a family doing house management slash tutoring and it was the most stressed out I've ever been in my entire life and I'm normally not a stressful person I'm very laid back easy going but during that time I was I was like eating one meal a day at nine o'clock at night I was living on monster energy drinks fearing the email or the phone call that was gonna be some sort of catastrophic explosion Fortunately, at the time, Carol was getting into neurofeedback for herself, and so she used me as one of her guinea pigs. Um, and, and I was shocked with how it helped me uh, to go from a reactive state where I was always reacting to situations that were happening to being more proactive, more um, uh, assured in my own energies to where other people's energy wouldn't cause me to, to get in a dysregulated energy. Um, I do want to kind of reiterate what Carol said and the fact that it, neurofeedback's not a magic bullet. In conjunction with all other types of therapy, it's a great component, but it's not a magic bullet. There was a quote earlier on the board, I forget exactly what the quote was or who said it, but essentially it was the most important part of recovery is relationships and I truly believe that because I see a lot of times people go through trauma because of relationships so in order to heal that it's important that they're given a positive relationship so I just kind of want to reiterate that I work at the Bell Shelter in the morning and I work at a place in Pacific Palisades in the afternoon and once again neurofeedback is just a component of the trauma healing. Um, we find it's a good way for clients to get work done without feeling like they're getting work done. So we're usually up there along with yoga, massage, and acupuncture, people like neurofeedback a lot because it's more of a, um, I, I don't know how to explain it, but more um, a subconscious type healing effort to where you're just sitting and watching, so. Yeah, it won't teach you how to not have irrational beliefs. It won't tell you how to have better relationships with others. It's just a tool in your toolbox.
But one of the things that it does, or a couple things that I've seen it work really well with um, sleep, and usually sleep, uh, sleep issues due to anxiety, due to recurring memories, due to nightmares and night terrors. Um, with a good amount of training, we see a lot of movement in those areas. Um, I've, I've, I've had, I have a female right now that we're seeing who had a tremendous, she was having probably four or five night terrors a week. We're getting her down to about one, one a month now, uh, which is a huge game changer for her. Um, she's able to sleep through the night. She said she's even had good dreams, which is mind blowing for her. Um, we had a gentleman early on at uh, Bell Shelter who was having panic attacks, uh, same thing, about four or five a week. He said he'd wake up in the morning and he'd almost have a panic attack thinking about the panic attack that's on its way that day. He'd been to the hospital over a couple hundred times because he thought he was having heart attacks. Um, he came in and did about four months of pretty intense neurofeedback. He said he had tried all kinds of other things. Once again, we got him down to about one panic attack a week. Um, I had a gentleman come in with repressed memories, and once those memories came up, he said he went 12 years where he would get three hours of sleep every third night. So he'd be up for 72 hours, his body would finally say, okay, you've had enough, we're gonna do three hours. By the time he left us, we were getting five to six hours every night for him. Um, he, he told me one time he was on the bus going, going to an interview or something. He said, I fell asleep on the bus. He goes, I can't believe it. It never would have happened before. So we see that the brain is able to regulate itself. One of the examples Carol taught me, uh, a lot of times when the brain goes through trauma, it gets stuck in the fight or flight mode. And an example we give with neurofeedback is people who scuba dive for the first time and they put a regulator in their mouth. They're not used to it, so the breathing is hard and heavy. It's <laughs> But once they can hear their breath, they're able to calm it down and regulate it and be more. <sighs> That's essentially what we're trying to do with the brain. We're trying to let the brain see that it's in the <sighs> or the fight or flight mode and allow it to regulate itself into a calm and alert mode. As Ben's talking, it's reminding me of a couple stories, and we could go on with a lot of stories, so I'm gonna just share two, and then I'll leave it to questions, but um, it's reminding me of another person uh, after the study who came in, and he was in prison for over 20 years. So they actually had to have someone walk him to the neurofeedback clinic because he was so fearful of just going, like, to be in this big environment, it was scary for him to just walk from one building to another, so he had to be escorted because being in prison for 20 years, he didn't have that kind of freedom. And he did neurofeedback, and <laughs> he did so well. He was taking buses to other states. <laughs> he was, he, over time, it's just he really was able to get himself so that he wasn't in that anxious space, and it was beautiful to see that happen. So I was thinking about that, and the other story I'm just going to tell you is um, there's a lot of drug use that happens with trauma, as you know. And we had one person in the study whose drug of choice was heroin. And during uh, the time of the study, uh, one of his closest friends, if you call it a close friend, offered him heroin. And um, it was, gosh, in the middle of, well, he probably had t 10 sessions by that time. And he said no. He said that he was able to think about what he was doing. And he knew that in the short term, he would feel great. But in the long term, he could lose everything. And he came back into the session. He said, I turned that down. I'm not doing it. I'm committed to this. And he ended up finishing the study and doing really well. And he did not go back to drugs. So that was a beautiful thing because that executive functioning came in where he was able to see that in the long run, that's more important, not the immediate fix, but the long-term results are more worth it, so. Yeah, and I think people often ask, how do you know it works? And we see it work in our clinic. I've been doing it for four and a half, five years, and I could sit up here for 30 or 40 minutes and tell you story after story of successes we had, but 
For me, the biggest uh, thing that kind of sunk in for me was when Carol was training me on neurofeedback, one of the sites she did was the uh, left prefrontal, and that's planning organization site. One of the things I noticed after about two months of uh, training was that when I would come home at night, um, when I changed clothes, I would take the clean clothes and hang them up, the dirty clothes, put them in the hamper, and subconsciously it was my brain saying, life's gonna be a lot easier on you tomorrow morning if you know what's clean and what's dirty and where the clean clothes are and where the dirty clothes are. And it was something I hadn't planned. That wasn't a goal of mine to change that, but the fact that it did, and it did it without me actively trying to do it, proved to me that it worked. So spouses, bring your spouses into the neurofeedback. The nice thing is, um, you know, in our clientele, we um, have such a wide range, and Ben will attest to this too. So here we work with the homeless, but then we have these people who can afford neurofeedback that are very successful. So, um, and um, it, it really, the gamut is large of who, everybody can benefit from neurofeedback, really. So. So if there's any questions, um, and just say who you want to have answered. She's probably the smartest no. of the two, so. Okay. I had a question back there. Yes, would this benefit autistic children, and where is the Bell Center located? Um, would you like me to So the Bell Shelter, it's in Bell. Um, if, you, if you Google Salvation Army Bell Shelter, it's in Bell. It's really close to the Citadel Mall. Um, as far as autism, they do work with it. I currently only work with adults with trauma, so I'll let Carol ask, answer the autism. Absolutely. It's great for autism. Um, so, you know, there's not a lot of um, support for autism right now in terms of, you know, people are, are, are seeking ways to figure out how to help people with autistic. Uh, one of the things that I found is a lot of military babies have autism for whatever reason. And neurofeedback is a great tool for autism. You're going to have a great speaker talk about brain and gut health. I'm going to also tell you that diet is very important for autism and nutrition. There's some specific things. Uh, in my practice, I also work with nutrition. And so if you could combine those two, it's amazing. The one thing I will say about children with autism is um, getting them to sit still and put electrodes on their head and sit for 30 minutes and watch a video can be challenging. Um, the neurofeedback, the neuro, um, the Signet system, does have little games that they can play. But that being said, even as a clinician, it's a little scary to grab a three, four, five-year-old child and like make them sit still, even if their parents in the room, so. Well, I wanna answer, talk a little bit about that because um, what I do is I have them sit on their parents' lap sometimes. And what you'll find with neurofeedback is the brain is so interested in itself. So an autistic child who normally maybe can't watch a TV screen or can't keep focused, because the brain is so interested, that little child starts just watching what's on the screen because it feels that it's helping. So it's parents get amazed that, wow, like this is kind of surprising, they're sitting still. Sometimes the hardest part is putting on the electrodes though. Hi. Um, some, I've heard some neurofeedback practitioners focus on how you can get off psychotropic meds by doing neurofeedback, and I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Is, uh, first of all, do psychotropic, like SSRIs and those sort of things, do those uh, uh, possibly limit the ability of neurofeedback to help? And also, can you reduce or get off meds by getting your brain regulated? So um, I'm going to answer it in two parts, one not related but related and then directly related. So one, if someone is getting on psychotropic meds, I don't recommend doing neurofeedback because the brain is going through a lot of change and so that's really going to be hard to like track that. The neurofeedback is like going to be all over the place based on the brain being all over the place as they're going through the transition of getting onto meds. 
Um, however, if someone has been on meds and is stabilized on their meds and they start doing neurofeedback, the neurofeedback will start stabilizing the, the brain. And we have had situations, um, many, where the person was able to, of course, with the advice of their doctor or psychiatrist, reduce their meds and in some cases get off their meds. Um, again, you know, um, we have to be careful because we are, uh, or at least I am, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist, so you want to make sure that they're working with a medical professional, but it is very possible that the brain stabilizes and that people reduce or even get off. And you may see that in the next video, I'm not sure if they talk about it. There's different uh, videos that we've done, so I'm not sure if it's in that one. And what I would say to that is a lot of the clients that I see at Bell Shelter, um, the mood stabilizing drugs that they are taking um, helps them function in a safe and uh, secure society. So uh, we want them to stay on those drugs as far as what their doctor prescribes for them. What we have had luck with was helping them reduce sleep meds and stuff like that. So we're trying to kind of chip away at that. So then it gets case by case, because like in a place like Bell Shelter, you have to be a little bit more careful, and depending on how severe the issue is. You know, if we're talking about, you know, bipolar, you know, I have them, you know, it, you know, it, there's, so it's not a pat answer is what I'm saying. Um, they may need to stay on meds, or we don't know, you know, so um, it's really going to be case by case. But um, we don't want people to get off meds, you know, cold turkey. You know, we want them to be working with a health professional or somebody where it's done, you know, gradually as the brain stabilizes, that they work with their health care professional to work on lowering, reducing, or getting off. And, it, and depending on the severity of the problem, they may need to stay on. If we're working with um, certain professionals, then, you know, it's going to be easier to get off because they have more support systems. Question, please. <clears throat> Relative to the, uh, the protocol, you've indicating it's about 20 sessions um, prior to seeing any um, significant change, I guess you would say. Oh, you can see significant change before 20 sessions. It's just that it's a training, not a treatment. We're teaching the brain how to do something on its own. So let's say there's this river flowing of anxiety, and its groove is really deep, and that river flows. We're trying to redirect that brain, and we're like trying to get that groove for this new direction in the brain to move from this river to this calm river. And that's not going to happen overnight, but you can see changes even in the first session. But for those changes to be lasting, we want to get these grooves in place. We want the neuronal networks to change so that the river now flows in this direction and not this one. Understanding your protocol suggests in 20 sessions. So how long, what is the duration of that? You know, you have a dosage for that, over that 20 session. How long do you have to, let's say, have a, a V-boost, if you will, or a second? Well, I have people that I've seen from years ago, and they'll have an important meeting, and they'll pop in, or they have to go on a plane flight, and they have, you know, flight anxiety, and they'll just pop in just to, like, you know, help, you know, support that brain. So, you know, it's just going to depend on each individual. There are certain people who have done over 100 sessions, you know, and the sessions range from like about 30 minutes to about 45 minutes or 50 minutes. So, um, you know, we're just saying at least if you're going to do this machine, do at least 20 sessions so that you can have some lasting change. You know, so it may not resolve everything, but some things will have changed in that person's life, you know, not temporarily, but in steady ways. Okay. And to answer your question, it's, it's kind of an industry thing, they say 20 sessions. And it's just to get the person to commit to, say, going to the gym. Like, we're going to sign you up with a trainer for 20, 20 uh, sessions. So with this, it's the same thing. I've had people come to me who got a, a girl who broke up with a boyfriend. She was highly anxious. After 10 sessions, she felt fine and moved on. Some of the people you see in the thing, in the uh, video, 100 plus sessions. So it, it can be a commitment. Fortunately, through Bell Shelter, they give it to the clients for free. So we encourage them, while you're here, come as much as possible. Appreciate that. Is there a PTS code for that, this treatment? For uh, PTSD code, yes, there is. I don't know it by heart, but there is a PTSD code. I feel like I can almost remember it, but I can't. Up front here.
Um, I, I, I get careful of the word heal because I don't want to promise anything. Um, but I've had people who couldn't speak in sentences who after the neurofeedback could speak in sentences. I've had people who even um, alcohol brain injury or com uh, concussions or different where or strokes where they just had a hard time speaking at a normal pace, you know, increase their pr pace of speaking. You know, so it's really helping the brain repair itself. But again, we can't make any promises because we're not in control. The individual's brain is in control. We're not in control of what they're doing on the side. If someone's eating a lot of sugar, if they're using, you know, some sort of drug or if they're drinking a lot, you know. So I can't, I can't promise anything because part of it is beyond our control in terms of what that client is actually doing. But I've seen amazing ch change with brain injury because it's the brain allowing it to heal itself. Any Go other ahead. questions? Sure. We're going to show you another video, and that way, if it leads to more questions, we can. I'll do one more question real quick. We do not use QEG, and uh, QEG can be uh, another form of neurofeedback that um, can be highly effective, but it's not the type we use. QEG um, is um, looking at the, they put a lot of electrodes on the brain, look at the brain electrical activity, and then they decide the placements of the, neuro, uh, the electrodes based on those graphic reports. Uh, this type, both these types of neurofeedback are a little bit different because it's not utilizing, uh, it's less the medical model and more the clinical model. So instead of the, the clinician being the expert of where to put the electrodes, the client is the expert and we're you know, addressing how they feel. We're talking to them. What happened in the session? What, what's going on? How are you feeling? And then we adjust accordingly with this one or we talk through certain traumas or whatever is going on on this one. So. Yeah, it's, it is a form of neurofeedback, just a little different than uh, these two type of neurofeedbacks. thing that I was going to bring up, oh, just before we show the video, you know, um, one of the things about that 20 session question is uh, the biggest hardship for me as a neurofeedback clinician is how much it costs. And Louise was talking about that. So, you know, I wish that there were a way to get more funding, like at Bell Shelter, if there is anyone here that knows how to get grants or do work, if, that's why I'm so interested in helping serve you because it's expensive. The machines are expensive. The, the sessions are expensive. And people need this. So I'm so grateful for the Bell Shelter to do it for free and you know, allow uh, clinicians to work there because uh, we need to get this out there. And the, part of the reason it's not getting out there is how, because of how much it costs, not only uh, the machines itself, but for the clinicians to do it, and people, and it's it's a cost commitment. So that's also why we say 20 sessions because you know we realize it's expensive. So we don't want to feel like people have to you know s spend so much money. Unfortunately, in my practice, I have you know sliding, but the people who can afford more, they, I've been seeing some of them for years, and they just keep optimizing and optimizing. You know, but it, you know we need to get it to people who can not afford it. We'll show another video. My name is Paul Wager. I'm clinical director at Salvation Army Bell Shelter. And my main responsibility is to make sure all our clients um, are having their mental health needs met and that our treatment is really therapeutically oriented. in the military from 1979 to 1991. Military, the history is pretty good. It was pretty good. I got 13 years in there. I joined the Navy when I was 19. I feel that um, a lot of people don't really understand what some of the military people have gone through. I have a history of depression and anxiety. I have PTSD. I'm going to bed at 12. And then I'm up at 1.30. What I, what I suffer from is panic attacks associated with uh, PTSD. 
I have 28 years. Uh, I'm just, you know, this is my last hope. Boy, it goes back to, I think, around 2007. Um, I got introduced to uh, someone who was with the EEG uh, Institute, and they told me about some of the success they were having working with veterans, um, specifically um, Iraq and uh, Iraq veterans at that point, some of the guys that were coming back with PTSD. And I saw some of the results and was just really intrigued by the symptom reduction that, that happened really so rapidly because, you know, PTSD is, is very difficult to treat with conventional talk therapy. Um, medications can help, but they more manage the symptoms. They don't really heal the brain and the nervous system. And when I saw some of the results rolling in uh, from the uh, veterans that were treated with neurofeedback, I was just really, really impressed. I feel incredibly blessed to be here in the program. And uh, for me, it's uh, I based it on interviews with veterans from the Vietnam War. And uh, particularly one veteran I spoke with, uh, his job in Vietnam War was body bagging. And he had multiple suicide attempts in his life. And he told me this is the only thing that's ever helped him. And, he's, and he hasn't had a panic attack since he's begun the uh, program. I personally think the biggest benefit for them is sleep. I think with the shelter environment here, having so many people sleep in one room, that anything we can do to help calm them, to help get them a more peaceful night's sleep helps with everything else. I've noticed where I'm not waking up after an hour or waking up after two hours. You know, I go to bed at 12.30, 1 o'clock because I'm a late type person, but I'm sleeping straight through the 4.30 or 5. I think one of the things that really impresses me is the, the fact that it can help with addictions so much. Um, several of the veterans have told me that there were opportunities either where uh, people offered them their drug of choice and they were able to say no, or that they were in a very stressful situation which would normally lead them to use, and because of the neurofeedback, at least they attributed to the neurofeedback, they didn't use. The things that used to cause me to think about drugs and alcohol, you know, are not, you know, weighing heavy on my mind, so uh, I don't need to think about drugs and alcohol, uh, you know, to deal with those things. For me, I've been more relaxed, and I mean, I'm already able to, um, like stay up all day, I'm alert. It relieves the stress and strain. And anything that can release that, I'm all for. We're very hopeful and excited for the future that we're gonna be able to have a sustainable neurofeedback program here at Bell Shelter. Um, and being be able to serve not only Vietnam era veterans uh, who are a part of our population, but also the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that are coming back and will be for the next probably four or five years. Uh, I'm a vet, so I know I, I, I know combat veterans, and I know you know the issues that they have, and uh, a lot of uh, veterans have told me that they have uh, racing thoughts. They have uh, they're anxious. We can't afford to lose people that could be helped, and and. and if it wasn't for some caring people in my life, then I, w I wouldn't know what to do right now. And I was lucky to be entered into this program. I feel blessed beyond belief. What I would really like to see is that it sustain itself here, that it be a long-term um, treatment that people can use because I really know that it can make a big difference. I would like to see us have a, eventually a full-time neurofeedback coordinator here on site and four to six neurofeedback technicians working, you know, uh, you know, 40 hours a week. Um, and, ha and I'd like to see a very robust neurofeedback program here. We were, we were able to serve every veteran that wanted to be served. Um, Carol, I wonder if you'd like to invite Rob up onto the stage so people can see the person they're supposed okay. to talk yeah. to you.
Yes, come on, come so. on. Because I don't know about you, I'm first in the queue. <laughs> I so want this. This is Rob Barger. Um, you'll, you can talk to him. He'll get, gather your information. He's going to stay a little bit longer during the break so he can take down your information. And um, uh, he won't answer your questions now, um, um, but he will tell you that we will call you back. So uh, he's the person to talk to after the session's over. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Real quick, I know somebody asked about Bell Shelter. Um, if you get in touch with Rob and you want to come out to Bell Shelter at all, um, he can get you in contact with me, or I can leave my phone number with him and uh, he can give it to you. Uh, so feel free to come visit. Yes. Someone asked for the location we forgot to answer. So around, uh, could you tell them where it's located? It's, it's Bell Shelter Salvation Army. It's in Bell, which is just east of downtown. Um, off the five, it's near the Citadel Outlet Mall. But if you Google Salvation Army Bell Shelter, you'll find it. Um, and just on the video, the gentleman with the gray beard and hair who was talking a lot, he was the guy that I told you was having the panic attacks and Carol said was having trouble walking back and forth. Is that right? There was a different guy. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you as excited about neurofeedback as I am now? It's amazing, amazing. And actually, the first time I heard about it was from a, a veteran, but not that kind of veteran. He was a veterano. He was a former gang member. And he, I, I, won't, do, I won't do my um, veterano accent. I can do it. I can do it, but I won't do it. But he's like, oh, God, Esta, this stuff is really cool. And uh, he told me about he'd done it, and he got all his family to do it. And that was the first time I heard about it, about 10 years ago, maybe? Seven years ago, maybe? Um, also, when we train, so this is why we don't have APA, continue education, for those of you who wanted it, we talk about neurofeedback. And we trained uh, in Riverside uh, Unified School District, and they are now referring children to um, a, a center where they can receive neurofeedback treatment. And they, the PSWs, the psychiatric social workers there, were just raving about how beneficial it has been. And if you're interested, the, the subject of autism came up. But I think the, the news line, the news headline stories has always been around ADHD, where there's something like an 85% success rate um, and you can Google, there's a video, an Australian video about a little boy and talks about his journey with ADHD and how he was so much helped by neurofeedback. So um, we are going to have an amazing film. You are not going to have electrodes. It won't go in and out. <laughs> we won't do that to you. We could actually. It'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? We could do a mass neurofeedback session. Um, this is a great movie, and I saw this a little while ago, and it's about a parent and her journey uh, really coming to terms with her own childhood trauma and how that prevented her from connecting with her kid. And in this movie, there is a, she tries everything. So actually, it's like your crash course in every available therapy for trauma. And she has a moment of incredible breakthrough. And when I saw this video, I'm like, who is that guy? Who is the guy that was doing that with her? Turns out he lives in Oakland, which is really good for our budget. Um, and so we have flown Victor Lee Lewis to be here. He, you'll see him in the movie. And then afterwards, he's going to show us the EFT technique that produced such an amazing breakthrough in the video. So we're going to have a 15-minute break, and then if you'd like to come back, um, more fun awaits. Mm -hmm.